are going to discuss pelvic trauma imaging and basically focus on the mechanism of injury for the pelvic ring fractures in this episode here. We'll begin with an introduction, review some of the anatomy, talk about imaging, look at the classification, and spend much of the time looking at the classic injury patterns to recognize these. So, let's begin. Uh, pelvic fractures are seen in about 10 to 20 percent of high energy blunt trauma. It's a devastating injury. The presence of a pelvic ring fracture will double the mortality of whatever else is going on with these patients. Overall mortality uh, can be up as high as 17 percent. However, if the patient presents hemodynamically unstable with a pelvic fracture, that mortality moves up to between 40 and 60 percent. Even worse, if it's an open pelvic fracture, meaning that there's no tamponadability by putting the patient in a pelvic binder, uh, that that mortality goes up to 70%. So mortality is most commonly related to hemorrhage. That typically happens within the first 24 hours. Bleeding sources can be arterial in about 15%, the majority being venous and a small percent being osseous bleeding. Uh, the pelvis can hold four to five liters of blood before tamponade occurs spontaneously, and the unstable pelvis is unable to prevent tamponade because you can keep then expanding the size of the pelvis. This is why we put patients in this uh, kind of a pelvic binder that we see over here. Those are helpful for venous bleeds, for bone bleeds, but if we do determine an arterial bleeding, and that's a separate topic, uh, those patients do require embolization or if your surgeons prefer pelvic packing, uh, that's also another uh, avenue to approach this, but that bleeding needs to be stopped and controlled in some way. Uh, we have stable injuries where the patient presents with moderate ligament disruption, requires non-emergent surgery, and that's in contrast to the unstable situation where the patient can present in shock, which really requires a huge multidisciplinary approach where we have to try to keep these patients uh, from bleeding out, uh, looking at their head injuries, risks of, of multi-organ failure. Thankfully, the stable presentations are the vast majority, about 90% uh, of these patients when they do come in. And of course, we have to think about uh, hemorrhage from non-pelvic uh, sources, which is the case in about 50% of pelvic fracture patients. So we do need to clear the head, the chest, the abdomen, and therefore integrate these patients uh, with whole body CTs in the, in the majority of cases. Pelvic fractures are most commonly seen related to motor vehicle crashes, as you can see uh, on this data here. However, mortality is different um, than just looking at the incidence. Mortality is going to be highest with pedestrians being struck and particularly with crush injuries. In those instances, the patients are not surrounded by a steel cage as it would be in a car. Uh, and so the risk of mortality goes up tremendously uh, in those scenarios. So let's look at the pelvic anatomy. Uh, we have some major parts of the anatomy you're probably familiar with, uh, with the iliac bone. Here's the anterior SI joint uh, highlighted up here. Uh, we have the superior and the inferior pubic rami that surround the obturator foramen. We have the ischial spine back here, uh, which is where we're going to have some ligaments involved. And we see the ischial tuberosity is, is the posterior structure uh, that lives back there. That is our greater sciatic notch, and that's going to come in handy when we talk about the vessels. The ligaments are there to provide stability. Two major groups include the sacroiliac joint ligaments, both anteriorly and posteriorly, and the pelvic floor ligaments. The key stabilizers really are going to be those SI joint ligaments. Uh, the symphysis is really only a supporting strut, and so if you disrupt the pubic symphysis alone, you are not producing an unstable pelvic injury. So let's look at those uh, ligaments here. We have the sacrotuberous ligament going from the sacrum, to the ischial tuberosity. Makes sense. We have another one, uh, the sacrospinous ligament from the sacrum to the ischial spine. Together, those represent our pelvic floor ligaments. Here we can illustrate the anterior sacroiliac joint ligament. There is a similar one on the posterior side. Also of note, we have the iliolumbar ligament that connects the L5 transverse process of the lumbar spine to the iliac bone. Uh, so often, Injuries that occur posteriorly will have a, a transverse fracture, or sort of rather a vertical fracture, that will displace the transverse process of L5. When it comes to uh, vascular anatomy, the vessels are mostly related posteriorly, uh, where we'll see the common iliac artery, the medial, and there's also a lateral sacral artery. 
Uh, the internal iliac splits off from the uh, common, so we have internal and external iliac arteries. The internal iliac will ultimately give rise to the obturator artery as well as the internal pudental uh, and visceral branches as well. We're going to see more posteriorly though, we're going to see the superior and the inferior gluteal arteries that tuck in underneath that greater sciatic notch, which puts those vessels at risk when we have a fracture extending through that region. Okay, so let's talk about imaging these trauma patients. We begin with radiography, particularly the AP view. Uh, other views that we have available but not done in the trauma bay are going to be the inlet, the outlets, and the oblique views that are referred to as Jude views. And then we have CT, which can come in different flavors. It can be done as a CT angiogram when there's a concern for bleeding, uh, a routine CT integrated in your trauma scan that may be more venous uh, phase, and we have the CT cystogram to specifically evaluate the bladder, which is a whole different talk. Uh, and then we have angiography. The search pattern on the AP view uh, really should have a strict approach. We look at the iliopectineal lines bilaterally. We follow it posteriorly to see if we have an intact ring uh, for the bony pelvis. Follow the ischial lines into the obturator foramen. Uh, and loop that around the obturator ring completely into Shelton's line, we want to see that those are nice, smooth curves all the way through without disruption. We can see the anterior SI joints uh, more prominently than the posterior SI joints on the AP view as well, and try to look through the bowel gas, get an idea of those sacral arcuate lines where the sacral foramen are, uh, if those are nice and smooth and undisrupted. And then look at the pubic symphysis as well. So those are the lines that we're going to focus on on our uh, typically a portable trauma radiograph shot in the trauma bay. The inlet projection is done around a 45 degree caudal projection and you can see inward or medial displacement of pelvic ring fractures. You can see if there's any posterior displacement uh, of the iliac bone relative to the sacrum at the SI joint and we can see if there are crush fractures and buckling of that anterior sacral wall uh, on a view uh, with greater advantage like this. We can also see the orientation of the pubic rami fractures uh, to suggest whether these uh, are anterior or lateral compression type injuries in some cases. The outlet view gives you sort of an unfossed view of the sacrum and the anterior SI joints. Uh, so we can look for vertical sacral fractures this way. We can see if there's disruption of the SI joints with greater advantage uh, on this view as well. And of course, if there's any vertical displacement of one hemipelvis relative to the other. The oblique views, the Jude views, are 45 degrees roughly in each direction. And each oblique view sort of has two uh, images on it as, as the orthopedic surgeons like to look at it. They'll refer to one half of this uh, here in green as the obturator oblique because we see the obturator ring uh, coming right at us. From this view, we can see the posterior wall of the acetabulum as well as the sacrum and the SI joint uh, to some advantage. The other half of the image is referred to the iliac oblique because we see the iliac wing facing us. We can see the anterior wall of the acetabulum uh, in this projection as well. So pelvic stability is really going to depend upon integrity of the ligaments that we've just reviewed. If you cut open the pubic symphysis only, you can spread open about two and a half centimeters anteriorly, and that's going to be the extent of widening here, and that's still a stable situation. But if, in addition, we start to cut through the pelvic floor ligaments, our sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments, as well as the anterior SI joints, we are going to open one hemipelvis until the iliac spines abut the sacrum uh, posteriorly in at the back here. If we add to that the posterior SI joint ligament being disrupted, then we have complete instability of one hemipelvis uh, that can basically be free-floating relative to the rest of the bony pelvis. Pelvic stability, though, does not imply a lack of hemorrhage. The two are more or less independent, and pelvic ring fractures should always really be assessed uh, for hemorrhage uh, in, in the vast majority of cases, I think. Pelvic trauma classification, how are we going to pigeonhole these injuries? Let's begin with the classification that really uh, is in use today where we're looking at vector forces, and this is really going to dictate management so that the surgeons will apply external fixation to apply counterforces uh, to the forces that are causing these injuries. We have four major groups, lateral compression, anterior-posterior compression, vertical shear, and combined. 
Typically, there's not just one that's going on, but there's usually a dominant vector that we can identify on imaging. If there really is no dominant vector or there's co-dominant uh, forces that are going on and you see two major patterns coexisting, we'll call those combined injuries. So, in review, we have anterior-posterior compression that runs in the anterior and posterior plane. We can have lateral compression and we can have vertical shear injuries. So, when we look uh, in these illustrations, anterior posterior compression uh, that can target the front or from the back uh, of, the, of the pelvis. We have lateral compression from the sides and vertical shear uh, in a uh, cranial caudad plane uh, that we see over here. So let's begin with anterior posterior compression, a blow to the front or, or perhaps the back of the pelvis. Uh, many of these uh, can be associated with posterior acetabular fractures for an anterior uh, impact. Uh, typically, you'll see this in a motor vehicle crash where someone is clearly sitting, it's often the driver, but it can be uh, the other front passenger, where the engine moves backward into the passenger compartment and you drive the femoral uh, head posteriorly out of the acetabulum by impacting on the front of the knee. So, the anterior-posterior type 1 fracture simply disrupts the pubic symphysis. The anterior-posterior compression type 2 will add on the pelvic floor and the anterior SI joint ligament. And then when we add the posterior SI joint ligaments, we're into the anterior-posterior compression type 3. So that's where we're going with these. Again, type 1, uh, we can have symphysis disruption, or if it's a broader force or a little off midline, we're going to see uh, rami fractures, that typically in a uh, vertical orientation, but doesn't have to be, uh, instead of the symphyseal disruption. There is no posterior ligament injury with these, no pelvic instability. This is what it would look like on the radiograph, some opening and widening of that pubic symphysis. Here it is on CT. Uh, remember, when you're imaging these patients, they may already be placed in a pelvic binder or have a sheet tied around them. So some of these injuries can be reduced at the time of imaging. Take a look and see if you can identify if the patient is in a binder or tied up with a sheet in some way. Notice that this patient is, in fact, bleeding anteriorly in between uh, the symphysis uh, on the soft tissue injury, uh, soft tissue window that we see over here. The type 2 injury, again, uh, we can have symphysis disruption or we may have vertical fractures through the rami uh, if it's slightly off midline uh, force. Now, we're going to go through the uh, pelvic floor ligaments here involving the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments and then open up the anterior SI joint uh, as well to create pelvic instability and cause external rotation of this hemipelvis. This is what we typically refer to as the open book fracture. It can be just one side, it can be bilateral as well. Here's some examples. Uh, we have some widening anteriorly in this patient. We look posteriorly and there's widening of the left anterior SI joint. That's a type 2 injury. Here it is on CT, a little bit of widening anteriorly, and there we see the SI joint disrupted uh, on the left side. Another example here, much wider. Uh, anteriorly, we look posteriorly and we can see anterior SI joint is widened on the left and to a lesser degree also widened on the patient's right side. We see it on CT, widening anteriorly, and widening of the SI joints posteriorly as well. Again, another open book fracture here. Another example uh, on this one, widening, again, greater than 2.5 centimeters, so you know there has to be more injury than just disruption of the symphysis. You look posteriorly, you see anterior SI joint widening on both sides. Now, with the type 3 now, we have our anterior injury we're familiar with. We've gone through the pelvic floor ligaments. We've added involved the anterior SI joint, and now the new piece is the posterior SI joint ligament that we're adding with it. So as you can see, this entire hemipelvis has been separated from the rest of the bony uh, pelvis. And so we have basically a grossly unstable situation with a free-floating hemipelvis, essentially. Here's a, a 3D image that's set in a soft tissue window, so it simulates a radiograph. We see separation anteriorly. We see anterior uh, SI joint winding bilaterally. Uh, and you can get the idea really back here that we have probably posterior SI joint widening. You'll see that better on the CT. Here's our anterior uh, widening and anterior SI joint widening bilaterally, but posterior SI joint disruption on the left side as well, making this an anterior posterior compression type 3 injury. We can see it from the outlet view very nicely, widening anteriorly and disruption posteriorly. And on this uh, example as well, off midline, we've gone through the obturator rings in this particular case, 
and separated the entire hemi pelvis posteriorly as well. Uh, the anterior and posterior SI joint ligaments disrupted. Another example here, a little broader force anteriorly, which is disrupting both the symphysis uh, and the obturator rings bilaterally. We see the force going all the way through the SI joints and uh, tearing off the transverse process of L5. Uh, to tell you again, we do have posterior injuries as well. We've involved uh, with that broader anterior force the obturator ring injuries on the patient's right side as well. And note the hip on the left side, posterior dislocation, goes along perfectly with this scenario on anterior-posterior compression, type three with posterior hip dislocation. So in review with these injuries, the type one is limited to the anterior pelvis only, so we have a stable situation. So adding to that, we involve the pelvic floor ligaments and anterior SI joint disruption for the type two injury. With the type three, we have complete disruption, so we add on to this one the posterior SI joint and the hemipelvic displacement. Here's a case example of somebody that jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge here uh, into the East River, something you do not want to do. Uh, they went in feet first, but they did not keep their feet close together, uh, and they blew open their pelvis, uh, basically split themselves uh, from below with perineal injuries as well, terrible, terrible injury. You can see the anterior SI joint winding, but instead of disrupting the SI joints, uh, we actually have a vertical fracture going th straight through the sacrum, which we see uh, here in this unusual injury on CT as well. So a uh, pretty devastating injury. Now we'll move to lateral compression. So we have a side impact force. The vast majority of these patients are going to have a crush injury to their sacrum, which is going to separate this injury and make it easier to distinguish between an anterior-posterior compression. So this is the most common injury that we will see, a type 1 fracture. It's the least destructive. We have a lateral force centered over the posterior pelvis. We will typically have a transverse fracture involving the pubic rami, can be unilateral or bilateral, but most commonly unilateral, and we have this crush injury to the ipsilateral side of the sacrum, uh, but no real instability uh, in these cases. Here's a radiograph with a lateral compression injury. We see disruption of the sacral arcuate lines. We have fractures of the superior and inferior pubic rami. I agree, it's a little bit subtle on here. You can look on CT and you see this little buccal fracture of the sacrum. Look very closely for those. Uh, they can be very, very subtle. Here's our lateral compression fractures involving the superior and inferior pubic rami, often uh, in this coronal plane uh, that goes along with the direction of the force in the majority of cases. Type 2 injury now has the lateral force a little bit more anteriorly directed in the pelvis, so we're putting some pressure on the posterior pelvis and trying to pivot that. So on top of having our anterior injuries that involve the rami uh, fractures, we're now going to have some internal displacement, going to put some pressure on that posterior pelvis and cause our buccal crush injury to the sacrum, but as well either cause diastasis to the posterior SI joint ligament or fracture through the iliac bone. This is the type 2B, and disruption back here is the type 2A fracture. We see this one more commonly uh, in our practice. So here's the injury for the lateral compression type 2A. Uh, we have the internal rotation of the left hemipelvis with an anteriorly directed lateral compression force disrupting the, SI, uh, the, the uh, superior and inferior pubic rami and crush injury to the sacrum here. And in this case, we've disrupted the posterior SI joint ligament as we show here. If we have a type 2B injury instead of the ligament, we fracture the iliac bone instead. Here's an example uh, with our internal rotation. We see the fracture, the crush injury involving the sacrum. When you look closely in there, we have our uh, obturator ring fractures in here. We have our internal rotation. We can see this on CT. We see the crush injury to the sacrum posteriorly. There's internal rotation of the left hemipelvis relative to the right into the normal situation. And there's our fractures involving the obturator ring the superior and inferior pubic rami. Here's the type 2B fracture. Uh, we can see there is a crush injury to the, uh, to the left side of the sacrum. It's again tough to see with the bowel gas and the stool there, but if you look closely there is some disruption. We see our obturator ring fractures on the ipsilateral side and our iliac bone fracture. 
and we see this internal rotation. You get that sense that that lateral force is driving the left hemipelvis in medially here. The type 3 fracture is the most severe and is a grossly unstable fracture. You have injuries that we've just seen with the type 2, but the fracture now goes all the way across the midline and causes basically what we would see in a rollover, uh, a contralateral fracture that looks like an anterior-posterior compression. So let's break this down. We have on the ipsilateral side internal rotation, and on the contralateral side we see external rotation. This is what is referred to as a windswept pelvis. So this side is a lateral compression injury essentially, what we just saw with the type 2, but now we're adding this whole anterior-posterior compression injury on the contralateral side. This is how this happens. It's typically seen in a rollover injury. So here's New York City, here's your yellow taxi cab. For whatever reason, this person's lying on the ground, gets hit by a taxi cab. The initial force is a lateral compression driving the left or the patient's right hemipelvis in this case. Uh, immediately as the wheel moves over top of the patient, the force continues across and ultimately starts to drive not just laterally but anteriorly, posteriorly. Uh, on the contralateral pelvis. That's the type 3 injury. That is our windswept pelvis. Here's an example. Again, remember, many of these patients are going to be reduced with a pelvic binder or a sheet and will come to you in the scanner often somewhat uh, reduced, making this evaluation a little trickier than it otherwise might be if you saw them uh, without that binder. So we have a lateral compression force with a crush injury to the left side of the sacrum here. We see left obturator ring fractures involving the superior and inferior pubic rami. If we keep looking on the contralateral side, the SI joint is open. So let's look at the CT, crush injury, internal rotation of the left hemipelvis. We see opening of the SI joint on the right side and external rotation on that contralateral side of the pelvis. Here are the pubic rami fractures we see on the coronal image here, transverse on the left, telling you the direction of the force, and uh, sagittally oriented or vertically oriented on the patient's right side, again suggesting we have that front-to-back anterior-posterior compression force on the right hemipelvis. So that's a windswept pelvis. So in review of that, transverse pubic rami fractures uh, are seen in all of these. We have sacral compression posteriorly, and we start disrupting either the ligaments with the type A in the uh, LC2 fracture or the uh, iliac wing fracture with the type 2B, and we have internal rotation. When we move across to the contralateral side and create an anterior-posterior compression, we've got an LC or lateral compression type 3 injury. This is our windswept pelvis. Distinguishing features. Look at the rami fractures and look for the, uh, the orientation of those fractures. This is not always the case, but it is very helpful when you do see it. Sacral fractures are really what's going to separate your lateral compressions from your sacral injuries. Look also for those posterior uh, acetabular wall fractures and posterior hip displacements with your anterior posterior compression injuries. Let's move to vertical shear where we have separation of one hemipelvis completely from the rest of the ring uh, with vertical separation. This is vertical instability, a grossly unstable situation. It is the least common, probably one of the most destructive pelvic injuries that there are. Uh, and we have a lot, the impact is off midline, grossly unstable, vertical separation uh, can be seen on the outlet view to a better advantage uh, in many cases. Often these are jumpers. Think about other injuries that you can expect to see with these patients, including calcaneal fractures, uh, spine fractures, particularly at the thoracolumbar junction, and potentially acetabular roof fractures and tibial plateau fractures. All of those can be seen uh, in patients that are jumpers that may sustain these injuries. So anteriorly, we can see rami fractures or disruption of the pubic symphysis. And posteriorly, we have gone through the pelvic floor ligaments, sacrospinous, sacrotuberous ligaments, as well as the sacroiliac joint ligaments, both anteriorly and posteriorly, uh, causing superior displacement and gross instability. Uh, here's some examples. Uh, we can see wide opening uh, anteriorly and complete separation of the left hemipelvis with vertical displacement.
uh, in this particular radiograph, this patient on a backboard, we can see on CT the wide separation anteriorly and posteriorly of the left SI joints, and we can see uh, in a different patient the fracture instead going through the sacrum and separating that rather than going through the SI joints. Uh, it really just depends what's stronger in any individual, the bone or the ligament system, what's going to get torn. Another example, uh, some vertical separation with fractures through the uh, pubic rami anteriorly and the SI joint posteriorly and a little vertical separation as well. Combined mechanism, again, just as the name suggests, more than one dominant vector or really no dominant vector going on, but I save these typically for co-dominant vectors where you'll see features that are great uh, for vertical shear, but then you definitely have something else uh, going on that fits with another injury pattern, in this case, lateral compression. So look at this example here. There's some vertical separation of the left hemipelvis, but we also see a lateral compression on the same side with internal rotation going on. Uh, when we look in the uh, from the bird's eye view with the outlet view, or rather the inlet view here, lateral compression to the left hemipelvis, and we can also see that there's an anterior-posterior compression force uh, involved as well in this patient. Uh, another example over here, lateral compression type 3, so impact coming from the patient's right side with windswept opening up on the opposite side, but also with vertical separation. This we could call a combined mechanism. So, uh, in summary, determine the direction of the vector force. Keep in mind it could be more than one. Really make sure that you're looking at a posterior pelvic ring because that's going to really start dictating whether you're dealing with an unstable situation. Remember, stability is going to be determined by those ligaments, uh, not necessarily by the bone, uh, but you'll see the displacement as a result of those ligaments being involved. Stab pelvic stability also does not uh, imply a lack of significant soft tissue injury or hemorrhage. And keep in mind, if your, pa your patient is reduced in a pelvic binder or in a, in a sheet or something, um, you're going to be looking for more subtle injuries, perhaps, than had it not been reduced by the time they come to CT. Don't forget about excluding other major injuries and incorporating your imaging of the pelvis uh, into your whole body CTs. Thank you very much for your attention.